you find you find your people. You find your the people that you're going to be with. Sometimes it happens just in the script because the way it is, it's sort of tribe oriented. So, right. you know, you have the Latino girls, you have the African American group, you have the white girls, you have the Asian group, you have, and then you have some floaters, right? And you have the golden girls. Thank God they didn't want me there. Right. I was like, please don't. I'm not a golden girl yet. Being on a show that large with that many people and new people come in all the time. Right. It, it it's interesting. You you do make an impact. You're but you're you're a quilt. You feel like you're part of this pretty extraordinary quilt. Right. To be in an ensemble is sort yeah. of the um I mean, it seems quite theatrical. It seems much like a play in certain ways, maybe yeah. in terms of the um there aren't that many things where so many characters are That's written right. for. But I noticed at the award shows, I don't see you there. (laughs) And I was wondering, um, (laughs) was that, well, you know, I just was curious if that has Mm -hmm. been a conscious decision for you, because a lot of people on your show do a lot of press and are very much looking at this as this is happening now. This is amazing. And I I want to build on it. And I'm, I feel very important because I'm on this show as well. Right. And so... Can you talk a little bit? I mean, just even getting you for this podcast feels like a coup, you to be perfectly so honest. You are so cute. You're um, so cute. You know, um, I think it's a combination of things. I'm not 25. I'm not 30 years old. I'm not looking at, I'm not a social media person. I I'm, I'm sometimes wonder that if I, what had been growing up during where this sort of hit, would I be seizing it? It's just not, it's just not me. The award shows, uh, premieres, red carpets, you know, you could just say it's just not, it's just not me. It's, I think there's respect for people that just aren't going to do that. It's like my heart's not in that aspect. I came into this because I wanted to, I wanted to be an actress. I'm not a self-promoter. That stuff just, I don't know, it just gets under my skin. So, so what about uh, now? So you have kids. Ephraim and yeah, Gus, Gus, who are both pursuing it. Let's talk about children actors and what's your thought about that. And they're not teeny tiny. It's not like they're the Olsen twins on Full House. No, no, no. no. But <laughs> they're teenagers, of, right. Right. I mean, your right. family's like the Lunts or the Barrymore. I mean, you're or quite something. a dynasty the Flintstones. Right <laughs> you know what? The Lunts, the Barrymores, and the Flintstones, when I think of sort of three great, the legacy <laughs> of those acting royalty <laughs> that's, families. That's us. <laughs> Uh, you know, the red green. <laughs> Reed, neither Reed or I ever was going to dissuade our kids from doing something that we actually love. Right. You know, when people are like um, actors and they're like, oh my gosh, uh, you know, I'll tell my kids anything but this. Well, that sort of doesn't make sense to me because if you're doing it, hopefully it's because of joy, not the paycheck, because right. that's. That's not consistent, but the love of doing what you're doing. If your kids are showing an inclination towards that, then, you know, by all means, we're going to completely support them. Why not? It's it's one of the funnest professions you could ever be in. Right. And um, so they see their parents go through it. They've seen their dad on a roller coaster ride. So they, they have no, when he worked at great adventure, when he was five, <laughs> six when flags, he, when he was at Coney Island he was... <laughs> running the, right, right. So, so well, exactly. I want to thank you. By the way, her husband, Reed Bernie is plays the vice president on the other Netflix series. That's right. incredibly popular right now called house of cards. So you're a two net, show household. Yeah, so we're just, you know, we're talking about each other and each other's work. <laughs> All the time. That's what we're doing. You're amazing. No, you're amazing. But I think what's great is because we're all in the same boat. Right. You know, the four of us, we're all different ages, but we're we're like oddly colleagues. We're all doing the same thing. We all get it when somebody has worked really hard and doesn't get it or somebody mm-hmm. gets close. And So if one of you, like, doesn't get something, are you like... <laughs> They're, I don't know. We're we secretly happy. <laughs> secretly like, good, you're back where I am. <laughs> Square right. one. I wasn't liking it when you were getting a little ahead of mommy. I mean, it's like, okay, this is, uh, okay, this is where we are. So okay. 
uh, my daughter, who's 16, got asked to do um, Rose at the in the Rose Tattoo with Marissa Tomei this summer at Williamstown. Okay. Which is, a, 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 I mean, I started out there as an apprentice. It's right. a big deal. I think I was the custodian. You were yeah. You were on the janitorial staff, as I recall. No, but I were. I can say I worked at Williams House. Well, exactly. It totally counts. Totally so, counts. Okay, so here she is. She gets cast. Now I have to go with her this summer because she's she needs a guardian, and so they're like, "Well, why don't we put you in it?" Also, nice. You're like one of the like widows. So, in, oh, in it's the Greek worse, It's worse than that. I'm like an environmental performer, like somebody that's like back there with trees. No, but Connie, it's very integral to the story. Uh, no, it totally it's is. not. It's not really just you with like branches on your head, <laughs> looking like a tree. It's very important to the story. Oh, it's the tone. It's the mood setter. But so we're at this reading in front of all the casting people and Williamstown staff, and she's over there. You know, we're all highlighting our, our pages, and I'm like, oh, you my gosh, me. I'm like a mute. There's like nothing. And she's over there, you know, like. She's like, can I get another highlighter? She, this one's run out of. Dry. There's no more yellow in this one. I mean, Mommy, you know, go get me one. I mean, it'll be really fun and a great time. But, I, you know, I've never been on stage with my kids before in wow. a very supporting capacity and she snubbed me after <laughs> she's oh. like mom i'm so sorry you can't come there's an after thing so the after reading party I'm you're so out sorry um, i'll see you later she's off and running right and she will we certainly will help her but so they now, really need to help us. why <laughs> thank god why is this happening for her look you grow up with parents that are in this business, and like any business, you're going to help your kids. It's a very different upbringing than than what I had when I'm coming from, which was being a Jewish girl in Tennessee. Right. I mean, how many people? Were you the only Jewish there were two. girl in you and your sister? Well, actually, there were, there were seven in, in my family, and then I had one other friend. So there were eight Jewish children in. I the would state say of Tennessee. so. I would say so. Yeah. Was that in East um, Tennessee? Right. Your parents were not originally from Tennessee, were they? No, they were from. From Brookline, Massachusetts, and Boston, so they um, went down to East Tennessee to open up a company. So they had a, you know, let go a lot of their roots, and so they assimilated pretty quickly. I think so. I think so, without sort of losing their politics and their ideals. So you were very little during the '60s, obviously. Martin Luther King was killed on April fourth on my tenth birthday. I've been writing a book about it for probably eight years. And about this, it's a fictional of, 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 of a young Jewish girl growing up in East Tennessee in 1968. And I had remembered previously up to that, like my parents marching mm -hmm. in Memphis. And it was devastating. It was devastating to my parents as it was sort of watching the women that raised me and all these women that were the help in our family, our maids. We called them maids. And my parents loved them. But there was still, they were in the kitchen. Right. You know, it was still like an odd sort of separation, even though they would have done anything for them. And the night that Martin Luther King was shot, there was a coming together in the living room for everybody to watch. I guess Walter Cronkite talk about it on the news. Right. And it was a moment of seeing all of those lines just smeared are you in touch with any of those people from your childhood is um, anyone still around or alive or yeah we went back two of them re renewed their vows their wedding vows so they were married 50 years and all my siblings went back to their small little southern baptist church and was there for their wedding it was an incredible moment for me and they were family they are family and I was shielded from, I'm sure, a lot that was going on because of the nature of who my parents were. Right. And what a different childhood your kids are having growing up oh, in New York. Oh, completely different. Completely different world. Completely and... different. Did you love raising yeah. kids in New York? I mean, I do. I do. I think this is an incredibly tough time for young kids to grow up because of, yeah, because of technology, because of right. social media. You know, you bring up your kids in such a way that you hopefully we trust whatever they're doing and that their decisions are their choices are smart and 
and um, we're all so in each other's face. I mean, that's the great thing about living in New York, though. Yes. You're in these squished You're apartments. You're all in one bedroom. You know what yeah. everybody's doing yeah. and where everybody is. Yeah. You can't get away from each other. And that sort of keeps you so on top of what's going on. And and you've got eyes everywhere. And they've got eyes on you. Yeah, you better and be careful. So, I mean, I, seriously. And it's, you know, I think that is really great. I do. All right. Now, this is such yeah. a crazy segue. But as you were talking, uh, I was picturing that incredible episode on Orange is the New Black, where you really reveal to your castmate why you're there. And, right. you know, it's the deer story. Uh-huh. And it's um, remarkably moving. And part of what's so incredible about it is the matter of fact telling of it. And I wondered on the day that you shot that, did you do it a lot of different ways? Were you directed to try it in different ways? And are you privy to your story and your background? And when was it revealed to you why Yoga Jones had, you know, there been is imprisoned? no, there was, there's no reveal. So until you got that script, to, you did not know why you were there. No, I mean, I know a lot of, um, because this was based on a book that a lot of women, a lot of the actors on the show most of them probably read the book. Have you met the woman that you yeah, are playing? Yeah, yeah. I had no. I have not met the woman that I've played. I've okay. met uh, Piper, who wrote it, and it's her story. I have had somebody talk to me and actually show me a picture of the the woman that I'm playing, and she's lovely. So there's no prior, which is which is really tricky on one end because you don't know if you don't have a lot of information. You're filling in a lot of blanks for yourself, and then maybe you're given a script that's not matching with what you were filling in just right. because you have to come up with something. And then you were sort of switching gears, and it's like— Well, what had you made up for yourself as to why you were incarcerated? Well, you know, I figure if someone just from, I guess, my first scene and her sort of— like she's she's telling she's telling Piper that make a make like a mandala here mm-hmm. while you're here mm-hmm. and make something beautiful out of the experience as horrendous as the experience might be you can create something wonderful for yourself and the kind of person that would say something like that to me is someone who is also trying to do that mm-hmm. for herself. And and she says it in such a way, the nature, she's sort of a Buddhist, that she's yoga, that um, she is running from something probably pretty dark and is trying to forgive herself and is surrounding herself with things. She's such a sort of gentle mm-hmm. character in a sea of, wild out there sort of creatures i mean i guess this is the beauty of this material it's really out there it's it's stuff that seemingly maybe on paper doesn't make a lot of sense also the the crime you committed is really the worst thing imaginable Right. right and so as much as she is trying to live in the light and on this other plane where she doesn't have to remain in touch with the agony of that moment right there's also, I would imagine, a part of her that wants to punish herself. And yeah. as we come to the end of our interview together, I just want to say that I will never ask you to put a metal nail in an outlet Aww. as long as I live, Thank because you. that is how much I love you. And I love you, too. Thank you so much for having me. Parsons. You're so welcome. I hope you'll come back another Absolutely. time. Absolutely. It's been a joy. Thank you, Connie okay. Shulman. See you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. I'm Alana Levine. Thank you for listening. Please don't forget to rate and review our show in the iTunes show page.